So again, good evening to all. My name is Niklesh. Uh, I'm a graduate student at Memorial University in Canada. And the reason why I switched my career from an engineering background to the environmental services is because of my experience uh, and what I learned during my tenure at Tunnel. Tunnel is a uh, very prominent environmental NGO. I don't know, uh, you might have heard of it. Those who are in Trivandrum might have had a chance to see it or you know, at least uh, visit the organic bazaars sometimes. So I used to work there and that's what you know changed uh, my career and my passion. It actually uh, developed uh, my passion in environmental science and more towards in policy advocacy. And hence, uh, after many years, uh, after graduating in mechanical engineering, here I am now pursuing my graduate studies. With that, let us begin. And I don't want it to be a very monotone uh, webinar. And I really hope to hear some of your comments, some of your thoughts. We can have a debate. I'm sharing what I have learned. And I do, I'm not sharing any of my research or any of my projects. So this is some uh, this concept of an ecosystem approach is something that interests me personally, and that is why I'm sharing this topic with you. And I'm sharing my learnings actually. So we can debate, we can discuss uh, whether it is right or wrong, or if you, you can contest any of the information that I'm sharing. So I really hope we have a very interactive session. Now, OK, before we go into the topic, uh, I just want to ask a very uh, general question. Now, you have the popular emojis that we see in the social media platforms for a family. Now, what would make a family happy? Yeah, so it is an open question. Anybody in the audience can answer. And yeah, Sri Lakshmi, you can tell me the, their responses. What would make a family happy? It's a very general question. Uh, someone said respect and love for each other. OK. Respect and love for each other. OK, great. If I say that uh, a very good household income would make a family happy, would you agree to that? Would you agree to the statement that a you know, very high household income would make a family happy? Whoever is the earning member, let it be like either one or a single parent, if they're having a very high household income, I'm saying it would be a happy family. Would you agree to that? So someone has replied health and wealth for the previous question right now. OK, health and wealth, yes. Love and respect, health and wealth. So do you agree to my statement? No, I don't agree to it. Like only income won't do. OK. So you don't agree to it. If I say that, if there is food on the table, would it make a happy family? Yes, sir. it's one of the basic necessities. So I think food would is one of the re reasons to make a family happy. Yes, so it is one of the reasons. So if we consider a family as the basic social unit in a society or the basic unit in a society, food is one of the parameters, or you say uh, income, love, and respect uh, all those are one among the parameters which makes a family happy, right? Now, if you look at the World Happiness Report, the predictors that they use for 
a society to be happy is one is the gross domestic production or the gdp per capita the second is social support do you have friends and family and relatives uh you know, any social support whether you need it or not what is the life expectancy at birth which indicates health whether you have a freedom of choice whether there is generosity existing there whether there is help whether people are willing to help each other what are the perceptions of corruption positive and negative effect so i'm just listing what are the parameters of assessing the happiness of a society or a family okay this is just an example so i can say that confidently that you cannot judge the happiness of a family or you cannot judge the happiness based on one parameter it depends on a variety of parameters so that's the whole concept of going for an ecosystem approach now you cannot define the health or you cannot define the ecosystem with just one parameter or you cannot uh, define the uh, the management of an ocean with based on one parameter you have to consider it as an ecosystem so like we considered family as a system there are several parameters which define the family or define the happiness there are several parameters which define an ecosystem okay and you have to consider all of them if you have to make a choice now let's go with the basic definition of a system a system is any portion of the universe yeah you can read that so if you are able to isolate anything that you want to study so that you can observe the changes you know you, uh, i'm pretty sure that you must be remembering the uh the free body diagrams of th that we had in our physics in uh, 11th and 12th standard you know where those boxes where we drew the the gravity the tension by the pulley and all those things so e everything if you are if you are able to isolate the uh all the outside parameters to observe them it's a system now an ecosystem it includes the organisms the plants animals as well as the landscape which in which they are in so with this basic definition we are trying to see how oceans are affected how we are able to manage the oceans how we are able to benefit from the oceans now unless we see it as a full system and if we unless we stop seeing them as one resource alone for example if you are taking the resource of sardines alone or mati if you are taking it as alone if you are assessing the whole fisheries management based on one species alone we won't be able to do a good job at it if you are able if you are seeing the pollution aspect of it alone and if you are managing the pollution no we won't be able to see the full aspect of it so we need to approach it as a system where we addressed all the parameters now to understand the system we would need indicators because it is very complex ocean is one of the most magnificent uh life of uh, life supporting platforms it is the birthplace of life itself so such a vibrant diverse you know platform you know we need some measuring parameters so that is where the role of indicators come now indicators help us to understand the complex system the same way we had predictors for happiness we are having indicators to understand the ecology of oceans now ecosystems health can be defined as its ability to realize functions which is decided by the society and maintain them over a long time now that statement essentially means sustainability so sustainability means you should be able to meet the current needs and also the future needs right anything anything should be sustainable business should be sustainable okay like life should be sustainable resource should be sustainable so you should be able to meet the needs of the current generation and you should also be able to meet of the future now if you twist that a bit okay it is in the uh, definition of ecosystem health it is defined as to realize able ability to realize functions decided by the society 
now if we include the functional activities okay the processes which means your absorption of sunlight converting the solar energy to chemical energy or stored chemical energy in the form of proteins and then you know transferring that energy from one value uh, from one chain to the other from the primary producers to the primary consumers and up to the top of the food chain we call that as a functional activity okay now if we include the functional activity of energy production and then transfer of energy from one organism or, or from one species or from the consumer to the next and also the supporting system the structure which supports that activity which is the ocean okay the health of the ocean parameters of the ocean if we include both of them as a societal need we are defining the health of an ocean system correctly so which means that a healthy ocean system should be able to meet the existing functional activities or energy production and then uh like energy transfer at the same time the current existing characteristics of the ocean which is the current temperature the current salinity the current uh you know if it is uh if the currents are happening at the same time if the, the tides are not changing if the the weather is not changing so if all of them are being met or if all those needs are being met then we define that it is a healthy system now if you look at the diagram on the right okay now you have the primary producers which like the the phytoplankton or you know microscopic and you know, very small living organisms who absorb the solar uh, energy and then they produce uh, food material out of them like like any other vegetation on the on the land so phytoplankton they absorb the energy or they are called the, the primary producers and then the zooplankton which are the primary consumers they feed on these phytoplanktons and then the zooplankton is fed on by smaller species of fish and then they are uh, being uh, they're fed on by the the bigger fish and finally the tertiary or the apex consumers is the humans so on this diagram it says what we have all the parameters which is required for a healthy ocean now if we consider all of them and not just any one of them we cannot isolate and then manage any one of them to benefit the need of all because we are linked by all of them that is exactly what is explained in the food web now in a food web like i said before you have the phytoplankton which absorbs the sunlight absorbs carbon dioxide which is the functions as the greatest carbon sink in the world they convert the energy and the zooplankton which is the the primary consumers they feed on them and then we have the the first level of fish and then we have the the bigger fish and then we consume on them so this is the food web and this if you are able to understand the food web properly you can understand the ecosystem approach properly now here we have the the structural functionalities of the ocean which enables growth which enables the growth of phytoplankton which enables the growth of seaweed sea grasses then you have the functional parameters which is energy production and like energy and mass transfer okay from one level to the next that explains the food web and if you are able to conserve and sustain every element on the food web with the current existing relationships between all the species then you are able to adopt an ecosystem approach okay now since we talked a lot of fishes and you know uh, the species 
what did you have for lunch today? So let us see whether we are able to relate what we eat on a daily life to the ecosystem approach. So can someone tell me what they had for lunch today? Like any one of you. We in Kerala, we, uh, we have fish as one of our staple diets. It is a major source of protein. So if any one of you had fish today for lunch, what did you have? So someone has commented rice and fish. OK, what type of fish? Was it the mackerel? Or was it sardine? Or was it the kingfish? Or was it prawns or squid? Kingfish, sir. Okay. So kingfish. So you, uh, they had someone, uh, a fish species that is on top of the, the food web, right? So now just imagine if the whole society has a liking towards the kingfish. Now you are removing the top predator from the food web. Just imagine how would how would that impact the food web? You're removing one fish species from the whole food web. I'll, I'll show the, the diagram again. The bigger ones, which means that there will be no control over the population or, or on the level three, which means they would feed continuously on the food plankton and their population will diminish until a stage comes when the level three or the, the smaller fishes have nothing to feed on and their population starts to diminish as well. So now you know if the fishing uh, caters to a demand of particular type of fish, which happens to be, let's say, the top predator or, you know, uh, uh, a species that sits very high up in the food web. If th that is taken away, or if the population decreases, I just explained how it would affect the whole food web. That is exactly what, what is happening as a stress on marine life. Now, there are a lot of parameters. Like I said, there are a lot of indicators. So, you know, we can find a lot of indicators to define or to understand the stress on marine life. Because ultimately, we want all the functionalities of the ocean to be met for the current generation and for the future generation, right? Which means the sustainability of oceans. So in order to understand what are the stresses, we should look them one by one. Now, in today's webinar, you know, I want to focus on very few things. It is like just three things. I'm taking one of them, one of the stress on marine life. And let's see how that is impacting it. Let's take the case of overfishing. Now, in India, there are we have people who depend on fisheries so much. Then there are like people use a wide range of uh, fisheries techniques and tools and gears for fishing. We have the canoe boats. We have the the traditional uh, the China nets, and we have the uh, deep sea trawlers, and we have the you know the normal trawlers. So in such a scenario where trawling or the the number of trawlers have increased, okay, we are seeing a higher amount of overfishing or what we call it ecosystem overfishing. Now, I don't know if you are familiar with how a, uh, a trawl works. So a trawl is a bigger net, and it is lowered to a specific depth, and it just sweeps the whole area along with it. Now, what happens is that instead of 
uh, so the, even in trolling, there are different types of trolling. Now, I haven't gone in much depth because it would deviate our focus. Now, what trolling does is it just sweeps an entire area and whatever gets caught in the net is taken as catch. And this method of fishing is efficient in terms of operation, in terms of economy. But it is not that efficient in terms of sustaining the ocean because it has a lot of bycatch. Now, in the uh, image that I showed earlier, you see a turtle along with fish, right? Now, this is called as a bycatch. It is not an intended species. I mean, the, the vessel did not intend to catch this turtle, but it is a bycatch. Now, if we go with trawling, or the uh, drawback of trawling is that you have a lot of bycatch, and it leads to an ecosystem overfishing. In the diagram that you see here, on the top, that is in the A, you see only part a, a particular stock getting diminished. Now, if that stock has the capa uh, capacity to regenerate itself during the uh, the ban on, on trawling, etc., then the overall health of the uh, food web is maintained. But if ecosystem overfishing happens because of the trawling method of fishing, then you're actually losing a lot of species which are not intended. So what happens is that the bycatch increases, unintended species come, the whole food web, the whole food web itself gets disturbed. Now, this is an issue that has been popping up recently and it has been noticed and studied all across the world. It has there are studies which evidently identified ecosystem overfishing in the tropical region. Now, we happen to sit in the tropical region. And it is just not in the tropical region. Ecosystem or the total fish stock. Now, when I'm saying ecosystem fishing, it means that the total fish stock in the ocean is diminishing. And that is a trend which has been identified in East Africa, Northern Europe, North Atlantic, Pacific Coast, so, uh, of the South America. So it is not just happening in India or it is not just happening uh, in the tropical area. It is happening all around the world. Now that is because it is the, the whole process of fishing becoming more mechanized, which means that more trawling vessels and deep sea fishing is taking place. And actually that is what giving us the food. Now, 40%, around 40% of the total fish that lands on land, or oh, sorry, that lands in the market is from trawling. So the majority of what we eat, if not uh, in terms of Kerala, but in globally is from trawling or from large scale methods. Now that has a very big impact in you know, ecosystem fishing and that is, diminishing the food, uh, the fish stocks that we have. Now, how do we address this? Because we ultimately want the oceans to be sustainable, right? Now, we should be able to use the fisheries for a longer term and with the help of conservation and management. Now, as per the CMFRI, which is the Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute of India, which has its sent, uh, base in Kochi, now, they themselves have identified that the states, like, like every state in India, should assess the impacts of environmental factors on target stocks. So these target stocks are the, are the fish that we eat, okay, which they used to or uh, consider before. And the whole management approach was just to replenish the target stock. If the target stock is, stock is diminishing, then you impose a ban on fishing those stocks. Once it uh, replenishes, you can fish again. So the whole fisheries management was based on selective species. But as we go forward, research shows that we need a more of an ecosystem approach. And the, even the CMFRI, you know, I have personally felt that some of the uh, management practices in India are not uh, like up to the mark of what it needs to be 
but even in the cmfri guide they say that species belonging to the same ecosystem which means the same geographical area or the same system or associated with or dependent on the target stocks now these statements which i have highlighted in bold it essentially says that anything in the food web that has a dependence or is in the same area or is associated with needs to be assessed protected and conserved so that is essentially the ecosystem approach you have you have identified a species of fish or a group of species of fish that we eat now we need that for our current society needs and for the future so anything related to that needs to be conserved so that is how you reach to an ecosystem approach so if you check the uh, the flow chart on the right you define the limits for the total catch so the you are not defining the limits for the catch of just sardines in, in the area no you are not defining the limit for just kingfish you are not defining the limit for just pomfret you are defining the limit for the total catch so that you are avoiding an ecosystem overfishing so you put a total limit on the uh, you put limit on the total catch and then based on the relation of species in the food web you allocate how much stock should be con should be given for each species so when you are going for a fisheries management you don't define a limit for each a uh, species or your for their own stock no you calculate how much fish or how much biomass that we have in the whole area then based on the food web relation then we allocate stocks to each species for example if we have 100 then just using a number if you are having 100 then we do not allocate 50 for tuna or shark or kingfish which is the top of the food chain no you allocate the total biomass that is 100 in such a way that species at the bottom have higher uh, limits and species at the top of the food chain have lower limits now that is how you make sure that the food web is not affected at all and once you set the limits you verify them and that becomes a management approach for so that is how you manage the fish stock in an ecosystem approach now we saw how the food web needs to be conserved and managed so that the current needs are met and also the future needs so if you go if you can recall the uh definition of a healthy ocean system we said that it should be able to meet the functional uh parameter for the functional requirements and also the structural requirements now the functional requirement is food generation correct and the structure is what you need to enable the food generation now let us see what are the stress on the marine environment again we checked how an an ecosystem or ecosystem overfishing can be detrimental to sustainable oceans and how we should allocate a total catch for all the fish stock then allocate species by species so that is the ecosystem approach to fisheries management now we are looking at what are the impacts or what are the stresses on the environment or whatever is surrounding the whole food web whatever enables the food web whatever makes it living now in that one of the major things that limits the life is the formation of dead zones now dead zones are areas where there is very low dissolved oxygen we know that of uh, the all the aquatic uh, animals they need dissolved oxygen to live now what if there is no oxygen or what if there is less oxygen so that though it actually limits life itself and those areas are called dead zones now dead zones are formed when there is an excess of agriculture runoff that means whatever we apply on our field 
as industrial chemical fertilizers and pesticides, any industrial effluents, any sewage that opens up to the canal, which leads to the river and finally ends up in the ocean. It gives an excess nutrient in the ocean. Now we have microbial organisms in the ocean, which disintegrate these chemicals and pollutants. Now, when these microorganisms function, they use up the oxygen and they leave very little oxygen for the fish. So if you see the diagram on the right, you have the dissolved oxygen level here. You have the inflow of pollutants. Now, as it goes, the pollutants are actually getting disintegrated. Okay, if you can follow the line that I'm showing with the cursor, the this shows the influx of pollutants and agriculture runoff, any fertilizers, any sewage. As the level of pollutants decrease, it means that more and more bacteria is functioning, consuming more oxygen so that the pollutants are disintegrated. Now, once this process begins, as once the bacteria starts functioning, the level of oxygen goes down. As the level of oxygen goes down, the amount of fish goes down. And it takes a certain amount of time for the zone to recover and to have the fish stock again. Now, dead zones, they can be formed naturally and they can be formed due to man-made activities as well. Now, those which are formed naturally tend to, uh, they do not tend to remain there forever. But those due to human activities, they tend to remain there. Now, another process which leads to a dead zone is an algal bloom. Now, you, you might have uh, uh, studied that in the 11th and 12th or even the 10th, the environmental studies. Now, you have seen what is eutrophication, what is an algal bloom. Now, when there is an abundance of nutrients, again, they need not be pollutants, but just nutrients. When there is an abundance of, abundance of nutrients, the algae or the, the cyanobacteria, they tend to dominate and then they to flourish in the uh, ecosystem or in the, in the waters. And as they flourish and they have a specific life, and when they decay, they go beneath the water. And when, it, when anything decays in the absence or beneath the water, it uses up the oxygen there. And during that process, again, the dissolved oxygen goes down. And once the uh, dissolved oxygen goes down, you have very less, or it actually makes life impossible for the fish because there is no oxygen. So they tend to move away. So once it moves away, that area is not good for fishing. So dead zones is, or the formation of dead zone is a very critical stress on the marine environment. Some of the very prominent or the most famous dead zone is the one in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, this is mainly due to agriculture runoff. And you can see in the watershed or in the whole of the country USA, the major drainage that is most of the rivers, they flow into the Mississippi and into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, anything or any chemical fertilizer which is applied in the whole country, okay, that is the east of the Rockies or the mountain range Rockies, any fertilizer that gets supplied on any of the farmland east of the Rockies is drained into the Mississippi River and into this area. Now, which means that all the agriculture runoff, all the industrial pollutants, whatever flows into, into any of these rivers end up here. And this area is one of the most, most famous dead zones, which means that there is very little dissolved oxygen there and life or fish uh, marine life is just very difficult there. Now, another popular area is the Baltic Sea. And if you can re uh, recollect in the map, it is in the Western Russia, uh, between Russia and Europe, uh, uh, the Baltic Sea. There, 
the major cause of death zone is agriculture runoff and sewage another thing which again aggregated the uh that's uh, the dead zone in baltic sea is the overfishing of baltic cod now i told you earlier that you know if you just focus fishing on a particular species the whole food web gets affected now the, if that is a predator if that is a top predator then whatever it feeds on their population is not under check and which means that the the primary producers get consumed more and the whole ecosystem goes for a toss or the whole food web goes for a toss so that is what happened in the baltic cod and interestingly when the cost of chemical fertilizers went up in russia after the fall of ussr in 1991 they some of the dead zones in baltic sea disappeared which means that when the cost of chemical fertilizers went up the amount of nutrients flowing into the, into the dead zone in the uh, baltic sea reduced and it allowed the sea to re- regenerate itself so that the dead zone disappeared now in this map you can see that we do have dead zones on our coast so it is not something that is happening only in the us or only in the baltics no it is happening all around the world and we to have it in along the coast of india as well and if you can see some of the dots they are on the coast of kerala again coming back to the food web we saw that if there is less dissolved oxygen this whole food web gets goes for a toss if baltic cod or one of these species is overfished the whole food web goes for a toss now another parameter or another stress factor is microplastics you you must have seen a million photographs about plastics in the ocean some of them that kick they come to my mind is uh the straw which is getting pulled out of a turtle like how many of you have seen that those who have seen that uh, video of a straw getting pulled out of at the turtle just say yes uh, in the chat sri lakshmi can you take account of that because those are the very popular photographs and i'm very sure that some of you must have seen it you people said yes sir the yes okay uh, what are the some of the other photographs that you have seen on on plastics something that you must have seen in the paper or on social media that you know that you are able to recollect now like what, what is the first picture that comes to your mind about uh, when i say plastics in ocean if somebody can like unmute and speak it would be great is anyone there or or have they just muted the mic turned off the video and then you know having a coffee or watching some series just plastic waste uh, floating on the surface and all okay so uh, we have one person who says that uh, she remembers plastic waste floating on the ocean okay give me another example what is the fir- what is the first picture that comes to your mind when i say plastics in ocean come on there are 20 people in the the webinar some of you must have seen it
A plastica being recovered from a dead fish body. Yes, I I remember that, and I also remember, uh, you know, small small pieces of plastic found in the in the gut of a fish. You know, uh, there was an image which was quite popular when the fish is cut in half, and uh, plastic pieces are recovered from that. Yeah. See, uh, these are the images that comes to your mind, right? Now there are a lot more. uh issues or i would say you know what you see is just the tip of the iceberg now the issue of microplastics is way beyond than that you have microplastic at the bottom of the ocean on the sea floor okay on the sea floor with a study is telling that almost 13 or 14 pieces of plastic per gram of ocean floor now per gram we would be like less than a handful okay which would be less than handful so if you just take one handful of dry ocean sediment there will be 14 pieces in it now that's huge and that is on the ocean floor and the problem is microplastics because they have additives and stabilizers in it they absorb the pollutants they absorb the contaminants around them now once they absorb they tend to move up the chain as the plastic moves up the food chain now studies have found that microplastics are found in corals in phytoplankton which is you know the primary producers in the food web in zooplankton which is the primary consumer and from there all the way up it is even found in the umbilical cord of a pregnant woman which means that plastic from it is seen or microplastic is seen from the ocean floor all the way up to the top consumer in the food web that is the humans it has been found in the umbilical cord it has been found in the human fetus so you have images about plastics in ocean about turtle struggling with a straw of a, a fish cotton uh plastic hand glove uh, maybe a seahorse holding uh an ear but so many those are some of the very popular images but the the actual stress due to microplastics is way beyond than that because any pollutant or any toxic chemical in the ocean gets attached to the microplastic and once the these plastic pieces enter the food web even at the lowest level even at the primary producer level it gets tran- it gets transferred from one level to the another to the another until the top chain now some of them if you see they just stick okay they just stick in the fat tissues now in uh, some cases the microplastics are transferred but in some cases they are magnified their concentration increases now this is a poster which uh, we made while uh, i was working at tunnel and uh, this image okay this image i didn't i didn't draw the image it was of course taken from the internet uh, but it shows that the concentration of plastic pieces it increases as we go up the food chain because the amount of algae that a shrimp consumes is higher the amount of shrimp that the atlant cod consumes is even higher the amount of fish that the seal increases again higher now one fit reaches the polar bear in this case the polar bear or in some cases the humans in there themselves who are at the top of the food chain the amount or the, the amount of plastic it just gets concentrated now this is another stress on the environment because it is being uh, it is acting as a vector now we have uh, vector borne diseases the, uh, which are called like the diseases which are transferred by rodents or by mosquitoes now here microplastics are perform the function of those rodents they are being the vectors for carrying the toxic chemicals and that is one of the biggest stress one of the biggest stress i'm not telling it is the only but one of the biggest stress for marine life now we have seen okay like 
I have only covered three aspects or three indicators today, you know, which can cause or which can lead to or management of them can lead to an ecosystem approach. We are trying to conserve the whole food web. We are trying to maintain, we are trying to conserve it so that whatever our needs are met for the current generation and also for the future generation. We saw how the fish, uh, the fish stock should be assessed for the total fish stock and not for a particular species alone. We saw how dead zones are affecting the whole fish stock and the food web. We also saw how microplastics are affecting the whole uh, food web. This brings us to the basic question, why sustainable oceans? I should have had this slide as an introduction, but I, I thought about, you know, saying about the approach first and then telling why we should do it in the end. Only then it will make sense. Now, fish is a very important part of our diet. The population is about to reach 8.5 billion by 2030. And the current seafood production, it only accounts for 17% of the total edible meat. Now, the land-based meat production, it has a stress. So more and more uh, industries are turning towards fish-based uh, source of protein and meat. It is only 17%. So you can just imagine how the population go grows up. The only stress is going to go more. And 40% of the current seafood, it is from wild fisheries. More than that, one third of the total fish stock, they are fished beyond the sustainable limits, which means that we are already exhausting the fish stock there. And because fish stock is over uh, overused, they're over exploited. And it, on top of that, we have 80% of marine pollution, which is accounting uh, for 80% of my, uh, marine pollution is from land-based sources. That is agriculture and not industrial affluence and retail sewage. And fishing gear is the major source of mega plastics in the ocean or the big size plastics. And these big size plastics, it eventually disintegrates into smaller pieces, into sizes less than 5 mm, into uh, ranges of, uh, or into scale of nanometers, and then they start entering the food web. Now, this is why we should have a, an ecosystem approach so that our oceans remain sustainable. We might think that I am not engaged in fisheries. I am not uh, using a, a bad practice of fishing. But just look at this. 80% of marine pollution is from land-based sources. If I am buying a product which uses chemical fertilizer, I am causing stress in the ocean. If I am putting my sewage untreated into the canal, or into the river, it it ends up in the ocean, it might cause a dead zone there. So anything that I do on the land, it has an impact on the ocean. That is why we need an ecosystem approach. We need to see that, we need to see the connection between what happens on land and how it impacts on the ocean, what happens in the ocean and, and how it impacts on land. So. If you take a bigger perspective, all of these are interconnected. And that is why we need a sustainable approach. We need an ecosystem approach. We should become more conscious citizens because it is not just in the hands of people who fish or it is not just in the hands of the government. Each one of us have a role in that. I hate to say that, but we are in a generation where people question why we learned trigonometry in high school. I have I've heard my friends say that, why did I study the Pythagoras theorem? I am not going to use the theorem to, to calculate the length of the ladder. I'm not going to use the Pythagoras theorem to assume the height of my window. No, unless we are conscious citizens, unless we understand the science, we would end up as a normal, as a person who is 
ignorant of science at a at a position of power at a position of responsibility through any of the government exams through any of the political parties and then would have no idea of how to use science so we should become conscious citizen we should get involved in nature clubs we should participate with the local government authorities say that this is the science i have known that this is how you should do it and educational institutions such as yours should become the epicenter for a cultural shift now that is by using the right source of information now as undergraduate student you might not be able to read and comprehend all the scientific studies and research papers i am not able to do that but you should be able to know which information is credible and which is not now in this presentation i have tried to cite the reference wherever possible it's not i'm not expecting you to read uh, see that reference and go back and refer later no it is a conscious practice that i am doing as uh, as i want to convey that i am using credible sources of information so your judgment should also be on credible information now this is a broad hierarchy of information that i would say you first depend on the scientific studies if you are not able to understand that you go to the international organizations like the un the world bank the world economic forum the fao uh you go to reports published by them if you are not able to understand that you go to the national report now every country has published scientific reports they have the reports on climate change the fisheries has reports I, i i was using the uh the guidance by the the fish uh, uh the central marine and fisheries research institute if not for the national reports have state reports every state government has report the the government of kerala has the state action plan on climate change now they have identified which are the vulnerable districts so you read that if not by the state reports at least you read articles published by credible environmental organization like down to earth like eco watch like wwf like national geographic if not for that you read the news or whatever is, is mentioned the scientific reports which is published in credible international media houses like the guardian like the global news like the cnn if not for that you talk to the local people who have been practicing it who has been practicing science indigenous science for generations you talk to a fisherman he would know when there is warm current and when there is cold current he would know when there is an updwelling in the sea which can lead to a very potential high catch now in this age where there is a lot of misinformation spreading around as conscious citizens we should be able to differentiate what is credible what is not if there is no source cited do not believe it okay and that brings us to building partnerships now i am one of the uh, senior mentors for an organization called green army now green army is an organization build, which builds partnerships among conscious citizens so that we can make a change now we try to work with local government bodies where we believe that this is the science this is how it should be done we part, we have ngos working with us we have volunteer groups working with us we have college students working with us so our focus is to start from the schools or education institutions like yours go up to the community where you try to convey what is good what is bad this is how it should be and we make a change to every house possible so today we saw why we should see ocean as an ecosystem and not individual parameters we saw what are the functional and structural characteristics we saw the importance of the food web we saw the issue of overfishing we saw what causes ocean dead zones we saw how to avoid that we saw the issue of microplastics and how it gets magnified higher up in the food chain and we also saw why we need to be aware of all these approaches so that our oceans are sustainable because we depend heavily on oceans 
and how we as conscious citizens should be part of the movement. These are my references and thank you. I hope I've stuck to the one hour limit. And uh, I know it was a lot of science and a uh, lot of data or theory, but I really hope I was able to communicate that in a level that you could understand. Now, if you have any questions, I'll be able to, I'll be happy to answer them if I can. Now, as I said, this is not my area of research. This is not a project that I did, but this is what I learned. I wanted to share that with you so that you too get motivated to learn so that you understand the world better. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sheetal, for inviting me to this. And thank you for uh, considering me. It has always been a pleasure to, to know more, to learn more, and to share the knowledge, whatever I have. If you have any questions, I'll be able to, I'll be happy to answer the way I can. And thank you for listening. If anyone has any questions, they can ask now. So I have a question. Yes, go I ahead. I have heard of biomagnification of DDT notions. So does it have the same impact as that of plastic? So is it worse? So uh, DDT is one of, uh, if my knowledge is correct, is one of the persistent organic pollutants. Now, uh, yeah, it happens to be in the POP category. Now, all the pollutants in the POP category, once it enters the food chain, it never leaves out. Now, uh, if you see like any other, uh, chemical, you no, know, which are water based. If it enters any body, you know, it gets excreted through the excretion system. It, it might be through urine or it might through fecus. But if they are fat based uh, chemicals, which get dissolved in fatty acids, it gets accumulated in the tissues and gets transferred. It might be transferred from one generation to the other, or it might get transferred from one species to the other. So my understanding is that DDT is one of uh, the persistent organic pollutants and it falls under that category, which means that once it enters the food chain, it does not leave, which means that it will move higher up in the food web. Thanks.